Uh, Sean Holden, welcome to Tararona. Sean, tell me, what do you do professionally? Professionally, well, I'm a university teacher, professor, full professor. Uh, now, I'm a full professor of East Asian Studies, having been professor of translation studies and dean of the translation faculty. You got rid of translation? No, translation is still there, I'm doing something different. Okay. I say what I do now is comparative cross-cultural studies. Translation fits in there somewhere. Okay, okay. So, to figure out how you got to there, where were you, what were you doing when you were 24, 25 or so? I was finishing my PhD thesis in literary theory on Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. Uh -huh. So I was already into a kind of multilingual uh, mindset. But uh, my field was Irish studies, Irish literature, James uh -huh. Joyce. I was a junior executive in the James Joyce industry. Where uh, were you? Uh, that was at the University of Connecticut in the States. Oh, really? Okay. okay. But you're Irish. I'm Irish. Yes. You went from Ireland to the States to study? Uh, my family emigrated to the States when I was a child. I went to school in the States. Ah. Then I went back to live in Ireland. At what age? Uh, early 20s when I went back to live. So you had a voluntary commitment to go back? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and therefore Irish literature? Well, I was always Irish. Yes, but to study you know, Irish. I mean, my experience of emigration is, is, you know, the hardcore emigration. I mean, my family circle was only Irish immigrants, oh. fellow Irish immigrants. I lived in two worlds. I went, when I went to school, I was in America, and when I went home, I was in Ireland. Uh -huh. And the word home only referred to Ireland. It's always, always referred to Ireland. And I continued to maintain my home in Ireland. So your English has no trace of American English at all? Depends. If I'm speaking to Americans, okay. it might slip that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So where does the Asian connection come in then? I was teaching at an American university, a famous private American university, in the mid-70s. And they decided they didn't want me because, according to their dean, I was teaching Marxism and not literature. And so I was terminated, one of the last uh -huh. intellectuals to be terminated in the 70s. And at the same time, China had begun its reform and opening up and was, was recruiting uh, foreign university professors to reinforce their teaching staff after the Cultural Revolution. And since what I was teaching was Maoism, not Marxism, I went to live and work in the, pe in the, in the, workers, re in the workers' paradise mm -hmm. of the People's Republic of China. Where did you go? Tianjin. Okay. Which was yeah. the third largest city yeah. at the time. Yeah. And what was that like? That was a culture shock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the workers' paradise. In terms of politics, yeah. yeah and sure. What I understood or what European intellectuals understood Maoism to be had very little to do with the reality. And after my first year there, you see, uh, before, before, long before I'd gone to China, I'd had a, as one of my masters, uh, William Empson. And Empson had taught in China in the 40s and early 50s. Okay, this is the seven types of ambiguity. The seven types of yes. ambiguity. And he explained how uh, after the communist victory in 1949, he continued to teach, but every year he had a f fewer students. And there was always a spy in his class. And it was always the same one, <laughs> whom we referred to affectionately as the halfwit. Okay. And uh, when I began teaching, I, I, I had a number of Chinese colleagues who were former students of Emerson. And I was always tempted to try and see could I identify which one had been the spy. But when I was teaching, we also had a spy in every class, in every group. Okay. And after my first year in China, the police were, it, were very frustrated because they didn't know what I was doing in the classroom. And so all of my students were called into work uh, study sessions where they were warned to pay no heed to heterodox European Marxists. Uh -huh. So I've been condemned by both sides. But at that time, which was the early 80s, uh, I was their source of information about the outside world. Okay. And either the spies did not want to lose this source or the rest of the students made sure they knew uh -huh. that, that I was not to be compromised. Uh -huh. How did we get from there to translation? Well, while I was there, uh, I became involved with a number of foreign professors and foreign students 
who were translating contemporary Chinese writers into European languages and getting them published, so it would become difficult to disappear them because the people mm -hmm. were being disappeared. Okay. And, and so I became involved in translation projects. In my case, it was contemporary poetry into English. Mm -hmm. A bit later on, it was modern, let's say 20th century Chinese poetry into English. And when I left China for various circumstances, I uh, arrived in Spain where there was a job available in a school of translators. What year was that? That was 1984. Okay. And I got the job. So I was suddenly involved in a school of translators and teaching translation into English. With your Chinese then? or No, it or was for English. English, right. I mean, I was not then a Chinese scholar. Mm -hmm. Before I went to China, I had no training in Chinese studies. Mm -hmm. It was my experience of living in China that turned me into a China observer. Mm -hmm. And so I've been a student of China, China ever since, and, and, and I learned Chinese while I was there, not before. So picking up the Spanish, Catalan and stuff. Well, actually, I learned Spanish in China. Of course. <laughs> um, I was living in a city of more than seven million people, where there were about forty foreigners of different nationalities scattered around the city, and it could become very oppressive. And two and a half hours away by train was Beijing where there was a much larger foreign community. And I had a colleague who was a Spanish lecturer who had friends in the Spanish-speaking community in Beijing, so I could get away on the weekends and we'll move back into a sort of Euro-American uh, cultural background. But most of them didn't speak English, so I learned Spanish. Mm -hmm. Good. I learned Spanish. I didn't learn Castilian Spanish. I learned Spanish Spanish. Spanish-American Spanish. Okay. All right. But that's what I had when I arrived here. Mm -hmm. Of course, I when I arrived here, I went to Barcelona, where I had to learn Catalan, and where I also had to learn there was such a thing as Castellano. Oh. So, very quickly, um, in, in Barcelona, in the translation school, you, when I went there, you were becoming director, I think, in 87, yeah. 88, yeah. I think. So you very um, quickly sort of made your presence felt. Well, within two months, I was head of studies. And after a, a term of office, head of studies, I became a secretary, and then I became the director of the school, and uh, turned the school into a faculty and became the dean of the faculty. So well, this is applied Maoism, I is, believe. Is it? Is. Political skills. <laughs> this is Leninism. This is right. infiltration <laughs> okay. of the system. Okay. But uh, as uh, the head of the school, I introduced the teaching of Chinese and Japanese. Mm -hmm. That would be the 1988-89 academic year. Mm -hmm and then began working to transform that into a complete Asian Studies program, which took another decade yeah. before we could begin to introduce other subjects. And eventually uh, we got the Spanish state to recognize the existence of such a thing as East Asian Studies as an official degree. And so for the last 10 years and a bit more, I've been more involved in East Asian Studies than in Translation Studies. Mm. But while I was involved in Translation Studies, obviously I became involved not just in curricular planning, but also in research and publications. And since the consolidation of East Asian studies, I'm more into Chinese studies, but from this comparative cross-cultural mm -hmm. aspect. Okay. You see, it, it's a smooth transition then, or it has been in that engagement with the translation to general cross-cultural studies? Well, I would go back to my literary studies, because I, I was doing my PhD at a time when English literature was giving way to cultural studies. Of course, it began with people like Raymond Williams in the 50s. But it was taking on a strong sort of post-structuralist semiotic aspect at the time I was doing my uh, PhD thesis. It was before deconstructionism, so it was still highly influenced by, by French, French thinking rather mm -hmm. than Anglo-American thinking. Uh, but all the training I had for literary theory and literary criticism suited me quite well for translation mm -hmm. studies. Though I often would contrast my attitude toward texts and textual analysis, etc., with uh, the typology of texts and phraseology and other aspects that were coming out from some of my colleagues mm. in terms of, of translation studies. So you, you don't particularly like the categorical approach or the descriptive translation studies approaches? Depends on what we understand by descriptive, because I mean, some people think descriptive is simply saying what's there. Yeah. Other people think descriptive is uh, placing in some kind of context. Mm -hmm. For some people, descriptive studies means making the ideological background 
become explicit. And other people just say it's uh, creating taxonomies of details of the text. Uh, I would, from my own long, lifelong ideological commitment and training, could never avoid uh, the ideological aspects and the contextual aspects of any aspect. Now, but also, because of the circumstances of life, I had to translate in order to pay my bills. So, despite my training in literary studies as a translator, I became a, a professional translator, a professional freelance translator, translating all kinds of texts. Mm -hmm. And at the time uh, Barcelona was applying for the Olympic Games, one of our former students who worked for the publisher who was publishing the documents oh. noticed that they were very poorly translated into English and French. And we had to set up an emergency team overnight to retranslate the entire documentation of Barcelona's application for the Olympic Games. As a result of which, in the late 80s, I was more or less in charge of setting up the language services for the Olympic Games until they hired people full-time oh. to do that. So I became deeply involved in the professional side of translation training rather than the literary right. side of translation training. Okay. So that's a big transition from the literary studies. Yeah. Really. I continued to do literary translations as well. Uh, and in the, in the 80s I was doing modern and contemporary Chinese literature. And as I, I was identified as a friend of dissidents. Well, into which language then? Into English. Into English, yeah. After what happened in 1989, I felt compelled to move back from the contemporary Chinese world, and I began translating classical Chinese literature into Catalan. Mm -hmm. Into Catalan because my, I was giving my classes in Catalan, and also because it made no sense to retranslate them into English. We had mm -hmm. more than enough versions in English, but there were none available in Catalan. And it gave me the opportunity to hone my skills in Chinese language and culture mm -hmm. by dealing with the texts. So throughout the 90s, I was immersed in classical Chinese culture. Then, in the, with the turn of the century, I suddenly found myself involved as, the, as an uh, advisor for the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and for the European Commission on matters of their relations with China. And so suddenly I was back in contemporary China, but no longer in a literary context. It was with uh, Chinese advisors to the Chinese government and the kind of political philosophical debates that are going on in China now. Which is one of the things I work on now. Okay. Under the heading, let's say, of uh, discourse analysis. Huh. So you're looking at translation studies from several outside positions then, but also with the knowledge of the translation profession as it, as it happens in the Olympic Games, in the Barcelona context, and also in, in international relations. From, from an outside, a relative outsider's perspective, what kinds of research should we be engaged in? What kind of knowledge do we need about translation, if any? Well, first I think I would say that any line of research is, is, is a qualified line of research. I, mean, I wouldn't disqualify any, any mm -hmm. line of research. Uh, my own work now attempts to get away from what I call the binary bind, uh, the application of dichotomies such as uh, literal free, you know, black, white, good and evil, uh, which seems to me to trap people into a paradigm which can only produce certain results. Mm -hmm. And because of my immersion in, in Chinese culture, and especially classical Chinese culture, uh, I've begun working on metaphors that come out of relationships like yin and yang, which are not mutually exclusive, they're inclusive. And even became involved with Martha Chung in working out a metaphor of uh, uh, pushing hands, a Tai Chi Chuan uh, mm -hmm. form of movement between two people in which uh, you, you don't, you're not looking for the dominance of one or the other, you're looking for balance and counterbalance and maintaining contact, etc. as a, a, for, a metaphor that will break out of this binary bind. So, mm. so I think that, um, first of all, the work I do is highly interdisciplinary. I've had to learn aspects of economic theory and political theory and international law and international relations that I would never have gone into as a literary scholar. As a Marxist literary scholar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and now I bring all that back again. Yeah. So that uh, so that I can talk about I can I can be an advisor on aspects of Chinese contemporary Chinese politics or economic policy or foreign policy 
on the basis of my ability to analyze the discourse being used by the official documents of the party or the counter discourses being created by what I call a defect social society, you know, and intellectuals, academics who are not uh, official advisors and who are, are trying to create a counter discourse or mm -hmm. what would be referred to as epistemic communities in the social sciences or policy communities. And I think that, that there is a kind of continuum from my earliest training in literary theory to this latest ability to uh, analyze discourse. Okay. One final yeah. question. There's talk in translation studies of the need for non-Western translation studies. Is that a, a legitimate appeal, do you think? Well, I've been so f deeply immersed in non-Western studies that I find many aspects of my own culture very strange. And it's very hard for me, coming out of Ireland and having been one of the first Irish post-colonialists, one, one of the first people to publish post-colonial interpretations of Irish literature, it's very hard for me not to see a, a high level of Eurocentrism in, in the dominant theories of translation, of political science, of international relations theory. I, mean, I, think, mm -hmm. I, think that, I think that's quite clear. Mm -hmm. And if we look into things like uh, Hindu semantics, I mean, like 2,500-year-old texts on semantics in Sanskrit, or we look into the kind of uh, texts that were produced by the earliest Chinese intellectuals trying to translate Buddhist sutras, it turns out that there are other uh, highly uh, advanced traditions of trying to deal with language and meaning and passing from one culture to another, which were ignored by Western theorists, uh, and which are now perhaps being developed by their, their, their own native theorists. I don't think that means Western theory has to be replaced by them or is inferior to them in any way, but I do think that all of these theories can learn a great deal from each other. And that uh, Western theory tends to be overly orthodox. Uh, I mean, it's like the, the three peoples of the book, you know, divine revelation of divine truth, uh, heretics, uh, there's only one way of doing things, there's only one mm -hmm. reality, there's only one truth. There's a Japanese uh, philosopher named Nakamura who said that there are two basic mistakes we made in the West. The first was Aristotle saying that something cannot be A and not A at the same time. And the other one is monotheism. That anybody in Asia would know that both of those are false. Uh, and I think that uh, opening up to other ways of uh, focusing on things is a way of enriching all theory. You know? For instance, there's an attempt underway in China to create a Chinese school of international relations theory in which they want to base on their own history, going back 3,000 years, in their own thinking. But there are certain things they have to admit that their culture did not produce that might be worth keeping, such as the concept of equality mm. among people. And so something has to change in their tradition. On the other hand, uh, their, ba their, their, their idea of a life based on relationships in which the human being is not some kind of uh, absolute essence, but as someone who is at the same time a father, a son, a brother, a friend, a lover, and that all of these social roles have responsibilities which uh, can conflict in terms of individual freedom is something that maybe the West needs to learn from. So, so I would say that uh, we need to learn more about non-Western theories and see what kind of uh, syntheses may arise from them. Okay, thank you.